All right. So, so that was your break. Um, we're now at the second of three panels, and I'll make no introduction other than to say thank you all for being here, and thank you for presenting and preparing. Uh, we'll be hearing, and Don will be moderating, um, U.S. response to select immigrant and refugee populations in need of permanent status. And I think some of you are doing a slideshow, right? So you're all set up with that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. What a great session today, huh? Isn't this been incredible? Yeah. So this is kind of the traditional panel that we have on U.S. immigration policy every year. And as Mario mentioned, it's about protection and people in need of protection and permanent residence and what the United States is doing about that. Uh, the panel is going to address the conditions that are driving child and youth migration from Central America. It's also going to examine U.S. policies related to asylum seekers, refugees, Afghans, Ukrainians, humanitarian parolees, climate-induced migrants, TPS recipients, and on and on. And it's going to discuss some particular programs like the Safe Mobility Offices, TPS, and the DACA program. And finally, it's going to identify barriers to migration, protection, and permanent status for these various groups. That's a tall order, and it's all going to take place in whatever, an hour and 20 minutes or something like that. But we have an extraordinary group of um, efficient and competent speakers that are going to be able to do that. And so let me, um, let me introduce them briefly now, and you can see their full bios in the, in the materials. So Tom Hare and Estela Rivero are senior researchers who co-direct the Central American Research Alliance, the CARA Alliance, which is this remarkable um, network of institutions, scholars, think tanks, and researchers that study migration from Central America. They work out of the Pulte um, Institute for Global Development, in the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. So actually, this year, I'm fortunate to have them as colleagues, and I'm really glad that they could join us here today. They're going to start off. After that will be John Slocum, who's the di Executive Director of the Refugee Council USA, or RCUSA, which is a coalition of refugee resettlement agencies, refugee-led agencies, asylum agencies, human rights agencies. I think he called it refugee-serving organizations, but it's a, it's a lot more than a kind of the resettlement agencies, which is what it used to be. And John has really led the rejuvenation of an independent Refugee Council USA during a time of immense challenges to the U.S. refugee protection system writ large. Prior to joining RCUSA, John directed the MacArthur Foundation's International Migration and U.S. Immigration Policy Initiatives. In that role, he was known as a real thought leader and a leading light in the philanthropic community, and we still miss the MacArthur Foundation in our community. Karen Grise is the pro bono counsel for Freed Frank, or one of the or pro bono counsel for Freed Frank, Harris Shriver, and Jacobson, LLP. Washington, um, she's our host today. It really wouldn't be a CMS academic and policy um, event if Karen wasn't speaking on asylum issues and giving kind of her yearly summary of them. And sometimes it's good news and sometimes it's not such great news. But she's also chair of the Board of Trustees for the Center for Migration Studies. And she's one of our nation's foremost asylum attorneys and litigators in the field. Charles Wheeler is a senior attorney and director emeritus of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, Inc. To say um, Charles is a nationally recognized expert on immigration really kind of does him an injustice, I think. For countless practitioners and for others, myself included, Charles is the go-to person on these issues nationally. And at this point, he's become something of an icon in our field, I've got to say. If you don't believe me, go and attend clinic's annual conference and try not to schedule a panel that's up against Charles's panel because nobody's going to come to your session if, <laughs> if you do. So we'll, present, we'll let the panelists present first in succession. We're not going to interrupt with questions until we get to the end, and then we'll try to leave time at the end for discussion.
Um, and we're going to take a, just a quick step back um, to talk about um, others on the panel. Um, and, and many of you here in the room are, are the experts on the US response um, in, in looking at permanent, permanent status issues. But we want to set the stage a little bit for how that framework works with or how we could better work with uh, the realities on the ground, um, what we're seeing in Central America in, in the recent past and, and currently especially with regards to child and youth migration from the region. Um, and so just very briefly, all of you know this, you probably know it better than I do in terms of uh, the history of child and youth migration from the region. Um, but just to, to take this narrow sort of case study of Central America, as Don mentioned, we'll be talking about Ukraine and Afghanistan and other places. Um, but this is really where we can take a take a little bite-sized look at, at what's going on um, in terms of the root causes of migration and, and how they're necessary to understand, but what we'll talk about, and especially what Asel will get into, how they don't fully, they're not sufficient to fully explain uh, the persistent migration intentions and, then, and thus the protection needs among children and youth from the region. Um, and we don't, in our work, uh, we don't focus exclusively on unaccompanied child migrants like we show here in the data, but this, the best data that we have in terms of the border encounters, um, the, the information that people are pretty familiar with from CBP. But what I wanted to show with this is that really we see where unaccompanied child migration is even up from the, the cases, uh, the, the crises of 2014 and 2019, um, and it remains largely and persistently an issue for Central America. Um, and it, but at the same time, it's growing from other countries, especially places like Venezuela and Ecuador. Um, and so it's something that, that we as researchers have, have wanted to understand better and better of, you know, the, what, is, what is happening with um, and, and to and among these youth uh, that, that continues these trends, really, you know, no matter what the numbers are from year to year, how many thousands there are, uh, the question is, what, are, what is driving those, those thousands? Um, so, as I mentioned, we tend to turn to the, you know, the so-called and well-known root causes to explain migration. Um, and we often focus on the link between migration and poverty, of course, where migration tends to follow this bell curve, where those who, uh, with, those with the economic resources to leave but without enough um, to thrive or survive migrate more than those with nothing and those uh, with sufficient economic resources to meet their own needs and those of their family. And we all know and, and past studies show um, the economic, social, and political root causes suggest that economic prosperity is not the only, it's one um, among many variables that are needed to, to really flatten that curve for, of migration from Central America and other places. Um, among the, these other reasons and, and, and root causes are things like uh, migration networks, entrenched inequalities, lack of security, migration as a rite of passage, and other challenges. Um, but what our, our work takes all that sort of as a given, right? These are, these are issues, they're well-documented issues. Um, they're ones that, that people are working on, their programs working on, there's uh, uh, the US government, regional governments, the multilateral institutions are aware of and working on. But what we try to do, and Estelle will dive into a little bit more, is we try to unpack the variation in migration attentions among individuals. So not just at the, at the overall level um, as a, um, among the different demographic groups, but each individual living in these similar marginalized uh, conditions. In other words, they're facing the same root causes as someone else. What is it that, that they face that, um, that really uh, answers or helps them ask and answer the question of, do I, should I migrate, should I not? Do I need to migrate? Do I not need to migrate? Um, and so, you know, we can talk about, is this a paradigm shift away from the typical root causes? Is it, as we suggest maybe in the slide, is it a root causes plus the psycho-emotional well-being uh, uh, perspective on, on migration and intentions? So what we found is that the willingness to migrate, or, and what we're exploring more about is um, that the willingness to migrate is often shaped by how optimistic individuals are about their future. And these other psycho-emotional protective factors, such as hope and resilience, 
when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about the individual resilience, not community resilience, or, or as we were talking about earlier, resilience to climate change, but the individual's ability to deal with adversity and trauma. Um, and, and the way that those experiences, those life experiences, that well-being impacts their intentions to migrate or not. So I'll let Estella land that uh, sort of broad perspective with uh, some of our data. Tom. Um, so, as Tom mentioned, uh, the goal of uh, our talk is really to put the migration of Central American children in context uh, and just to land see with all the presentations we've had before. Uh, we see this really as a growing ground for both voluntary and forced migration. Uh, the first thing I want to show you is the percentage of children who have migration intentions. And um, all the time uh, throughout my presentation, I will be talking of a survey that we just finished in El Salvador and Honduras about middle school children. Uh, this is a very large sample. We have 16,000 children uh, surveyed uh, in six to ninth grade uh, in uh, mainly public schools in marginalized communities in, in, in Honduras and El Salvador. It's the first uh, survey that we know of uh, or recently uh, that, and it allows us to understand why, uh, whether people want to migrate or these children want to migrate, how, what's related to their migration intentions, etc. So, um, one of the things we did in our survey is to ask children whether they had plans or they uh, like to migrate to the U.S. Uh, to live or to work. And what I want you to notice is uh, we have the results here by age. These are uh, very simple, but I think very powerful results is what a large percentage of children say they want to migrate and how that grows through uh, as they age. Uh, among 11 year old, 66% of them say they want to migrate. Uh, by age uh, 16, that's 77%. Right? Three out of every four uh, 16 year olds once say they want to migrate. If we compare that with the, uh, with the yellow bar, which is uh, 18 to uh, 30 year olds in, uh, in a similar survey, we can see that that's really right? uh, which is, uh, I mean, uh, migration intentions are really large, larger among young children. So it, it makes me think of, of, of a very uh, common uh, sentiment there. Second, the second slide is um, the percentage of children in the same sample who say that there is an either or they agree with there being an either or at least struggling with the fact that there is a good future for them in the U.S. And in the morning, uh, I mean, one of the things we heard was about love, about uh, home, and uh, these are all things these are really important concepts that are underlying migration intentions, that are underlying how children feel. And I think these results will be useful for another very strong labor variable that we'll see in the future, the kind of intentions and migration intentions that children hold and desire. And the striking thing in this in this figure is really how um, hope decreases with age very uh, strongly. Um, it's overall 45% of children in this age group, 45% say they think or they agree there is a good future for them in their country. Uh, but by age 16, it's falling to only 3%. So these two results alone widespread, widespread homelessness, 
and for the entire community of Palm Beach. His next year, uh, he has some bad barriers, something that um, just to show you that he has a good imagination. Imagination intentions are mostly unresponsive. Um, sex, feelings of security, um, those things are not unresponsive behaviors. Um, C explains why preaching must be correlated in this case uh, with preparation of patients is of course bad. Um, okay, lovely. Um, feeling of hopelessness uh, or hope that I was talking about, those things are about their being a beautiful creature in their country have a much lower uh, mag uh, magnitude intention than those that do not. Um, security must be related to uh, poverty and having access to resources. But even the most beautiful ones that we see in those cases, uh, those who are overweight and those who are hopeful or optimistic about the future, those or those who do not have unresponsive intentions, their, uh, their in migration intentions will not fall below 60%. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is to pay attention to the last two bars in, 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 in our graph. Um, the difference is really not strong, but that's a, that's a statistically a significant difference uh, between those who are resilient and less resilient. And by resilience, as Tom mentioned, we are talking really about psycho-emotional resilience or individual resilience, which is the ability of individuals to access, identify, and mobilize uh, resources in case they have them. And the important thing here is that those who are more resilient have more or higher migration intentions than those who do not which is in some sense contrary to what one would expect, but it's a result that we've also found in other studies, even after controlling uh, for all other uh, confounding factors. And uh, which means that in this context, and in such a widespread, uh, of such widespread uh, hopelessness and willingness to migrate, those individuals who are resilient will be mobilizing their, results, their resources to move out rather than in. So just to conclude, um, I think our data shows that the majority of children in Honduras and El Salvador um, are people who feel so hopeless about their future that they start thinking about migrating at a very young age. Um, and that they they try to uh, move on or uh, move up their resources uh, to get to that end. So, what does this really translate to in terms of health policy, right? Uh, well, we can think of both health policy in terms of the short term and the long term, as, as we've been talking. I mean, of course, on the one hand, it points to the need of formulating policies and interventions that make feeling feel at home, and feel hopeful, and feel hopeful, and that's something that's very important uh, about their future in the country that they are. Uh, but uh, they feel uh, hopeless, uh, and that they can thrive in their country. Um, but if this really doesn't happen, I mean, we will really start thinking or considering uh, that these really will be big things also talking the more about the denominator is a very really common or where we have up to three of every four children in the country, which is not a terrible comparison. Um, so and which can point to the future of a very large flow of migrants. Um, and with that I'll stop.
Well, thank you all uh, for being here today. And uh, my name is John Slocum, once again, the Executive Director of Refugee Council USA. Don, thanks for the nice uh, introduction. And uh, RCUSA indeed has uh, a broad membership at this point, 39 member uh, organizations, all national nonprofits that include the 10 uh, national refugee resettlement agencies plus 29 others. And in fact, while refugee resettlement remains a, a core, perhaps the core concern of our coalition, um, we have also intentionally uh, been, been intentionally specific about a broadening uh, concern for forcibly displaced people. So um, uh, asylum seekers among them, I won't I won't dare to say anything about asylum with Karen sitting next to me on the panel, and, and I'll, leave, I'll leave that completely to her. But um, for my own part, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the current status of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, USRAP, um, some of the uh, mass humanitarian parole programs that have already been referenced and with which I presume most of you are pretty familiar, uh, so I'll just do a broad brushstroke uh, approach there, um, some of the program innovations that we've seen in the space where um, protection is overlapping with the sort of migration management uh, profile that the uh, Biden administration has taken on, um, including the new Safe Mobility Initiative and the establishment through that initiative of Safe Mobility Offices in several countries in Latin America. Um, and I also should say that as, as I come here uh, before you today, that these remarks represent my own views, not necessarily those of Refugee Council USA, particularly to the extent to which I will, I'll dare to put forward a little bit of analysis on top of just, uh, you know, regurgitating uh, information that most of you already probably know, have heard earlier today, and we'll hear more about later today. Um, this is not in, you know, when I formulated my ideas for what this talk would be about six weeks ago, um, it was already in a context where we were facing this, this uh, multiple political clocks that are ticking, um, not only the inability of Congress to pass a budget, but the uh, election calendar, uh, which is on everyone's mind in this space. Um, we saw the story in the New York Times the other day about the, uh, the Trump campaign's uh, plans for immigration policy. Um, the less said about that right now, the better. But I think the political context state of play is so others who who know better will know uh you know what what's the the latest on that um what i should say though is 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 that i i sort of struggled for a theme for my remarks and then um alex lanikoff and and eleanor acer provided it for me uh with the very first interchange today and the question that i would have wanted to ask alex had i had time to do so is you're talking about um institutional transformation at a time when we have remarkably low trust in institutions, whether they be, you know, at, at, all, at all scales, right? Uh, and I think, you know, Congress is the institution that's probably the most uh, centrally problematic in that regard. But if you're going to move on from the, uh, the traditional refugee protection system and and sort of encompass it in a broader sense of uh, you know the the uh, the right not to be displaced um, you know how are we going to get from from here to there how do you are there other positive examples of preserving an existing system in this case refugee resettlement while managing to make such fundamental transformations as are suggested by Alex's uh, really is striking and I think in many respects very forward-looking comments and then uh, Eleanor's intervention, which uh, rightly pointed to the fact that you're talking about more protections for more people at, when the, the protections that are on the books are, are not being fully uh, implemented, um, when there is shrinking support for refugees, uh, the deputy mayor's uh, you know, response about you know, we, should, we should have solidaristic responses to asylum seekers 
Um, I'm actually from Chicago, and I can tell you that the some of the most outspoken protests against the location of a of a temporary camp facility for asylum seekers in Chicago came from a neighborhood and from a population which are themselves undocumented uh, in in large numbers. So it's not just people you know who are saying you know we got something that why should you also get it's people who got nothing asking why should you get it so my you know for me the in general the the attractiveness of a uh, an anti-immigrant message as a sort of a political entrepreneurial ploy um has many many explanatory variables behind it but i think one problem is uh, as we, for instance, at RCUSA, look into the, the real constraint on resettlement that, that housing availability represents, the availability of affordable housing, is that you're asked to um, defend and expand um, humanitarian protections in a broader context where distributive justice has not been a priority for us as a society. And I don't say that, you know, from any kind of Marxist point of view, I just say it from the bare fact that we're not feeding clothing and housing our population. And to expect a voter who is experiencing precarity to be as welcoming as we are being encouraged and we are encouraging them to be um, is, is expecting a lot to a certain extent. It's a very generous country. It will always be a very generous country, but there will always be, as long as we have this degree of precarity, and it's not just in this country, um, there will be a ready-made hook for a politician to, to um, put forward an anti-immigrant message. So that's kind of my editorializing. Um, let me move really quickly through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. I think everyone is pretty familiar with it. I think you know, we're all familiar with the chart that, that uh, plots the, uh, the annual presidential determination, the ceiling uh, established each year for refugee admissions with actual admissions. Um, that chart, uh, the two lines on that graph track each other pretty closely, except for two time periods. Uh, one is uh, in the few years immediately following 9-11, and the other is in the last two um, years. Uh, and to a certain extent before that, under the Trump administration. There have been two peaks in the, in the PD number. Um, the first, at the very outset of the program, which was established in 1980, 1980, 1981, um, there were over 200,000 refugee admissions. And another second, somewhat smaller peak in the early 1990s. Um, the highest was 142,000 in 1993 after, uh, during the Yugoslav Wars. Between 1999 and 2016, refugee admissions and the, the uh, presidential determination stabilized at between 70,000 and 91,000. Um, and then with the Syrian refugee crisis, Obama set the FY 2016 cap at 85,000 and the FY 2017 cap, uh, the last under his presidency, at 110,000. And then, as we know, the next administration slashed those numbers. Uh, President Trump lowered the 2017 PD from 110,000 to 50,000. In the successive years, it dropped to 45,000 in 2018, 30,000 in 2019, 18,000 in 2020, and 15,000 for fiscal year 2021. Uh, when President Biden came in, as was mentioned, a, a series of early executive orders reversed the, the Trump travel ban, called for rebuilding resettlement, called for an interagency report on climate migration, made a number of steps to, uh, to uh, be very, uh, visual in uh, very evident in in in, uh, in turning the page uh, from the Trump years, with with some significant exceptions, as we've already heard from uh, uh, Lee about uh, uh, the cases of the uh, uh, the asylum ban three and so forth. But um, Biden did not immediately raise the PD from its all time low of fifteen thousand. It took a few months of advocacy. Um, and in the spring, he finally increased that number to 6,200, 500, uh, 62,500. And then in subsequent years for FY uh, 22 and 23, 
And now again for FY24, he set the PD at 125,000, but we've come nowhere near to be able to being able to resettle those numbers. This was a resettlement system that was decimated uh, under the Trump years. Of some 300 local resettlement agencies, that number had dropped by about a third. Um, Long-standing community relationships uh, with landlords, among others, uh, began to dissipate, uh, as did staffing. Uh, for these local agencies in the absence of new arrivals. Um, so uh, the numbers have been climbing, but much slower than many would have liked. In FY 2021, 20, uh, uh, the final number for that first partial year of the Biden administration was 11,411. FY 22, with the PD raised as high as 125,000, uh, the U.S. only resettled 25,465. And then in this Last uh, fiscal year just completed, uh, the number was up to 60,014, uh, still less than half the PD number. And yet, there's a far better chance of achieving something close to 125,000 this year. Uh, in the present fiscal year, in part, this is due to significant process improvements, particularly in overseas processing, uh, with moves toward concurrent processing, doing the various stages of screening more uh, concurrently than sequentially. Um, the move to more and more making the process electronic. There's been a huge hiring boom at USCIS. And uh, alongside that, the slow, in some respects, painful but substantial rebuilding of domestic resettlement infrastructure such that we've reached and will still uh, will soon uh, exceed, I believe, the number of uh, local uh, resettlement agencies uh, that we had um, prior to the Trump administration. Um, in the midst, though, of first year, of the Biden administration, uh, the whole resettlement program, just as it was starting to rebuild, was given a huge uh, jolt by the uh, fall of Kabul and the Afghan arrivals. Um, uh, again, folks are familiar with Operation uh, Allies Welcome. In many respects, it helped jumpstart a rebuilding that program since Congress made available to the Afghan arrivals the kind of benefits that refugee uh, resettled refugees uh, uh, or at least comparable to those uh, provided to resettled refugees. About 77,000 Afghan arrivals went through this uh, Afghan placement and assistance program. Um, but uh, it was also a huge, uh, a huge size of a population uh, to be able to sort of uh, deal with in short order. So there were these military bases converted or used as safe havens around the U.S. and so forth. And the Afghans were only given two years of parole. They've been allowed to re-parole after that, but there has not been a congressional act passed, uh, the Afghan Adjustment Act, which our coalition and others have been advocating for uh, for a long time, without which uh, the path to asylum is very slow. And I don't know the current numbers in terms of how many Afghans have, have, have received asylum. I'm assuming it's still in maybe the 20,000 range, if much less than that. And... Um, and then so no sooner had the Afghan arrivals uh, begun to be processed than Russia invaded Ukraine. And um, this time the government responded with a somewhat different program, Uniting for Ukraine, um, which uh, involved a sponsorship mechanism. So there was less government funding, but more mobilization of, of society at large. Uh, the numbers uh, for Uniting uh, for Ukraine, uh, which again, Ukrainians come in with the same sort of two-year uh, time frame for parole. Uh, there have been over 300,000 applications, over two, just over 200,000 travel authorizations have been issued, and there have been a little over 160,000 um, Ukrainian arrivals under that program. That program it was then followed up in quick succession by a program for Venezuelans, which then became the process for Cubans, Haitians, uh, and, and Nicaraguans and Venezuelans. Again, these parole programs, not with an explicit need for a protection. Uh, not to sh you don't have to show a specific protection need. You have to have a sponsor. So we're beginning to see a kind of a, of a blurring of the lines between you know, the use of parole for protection and the use of it in a sort of a migration management way in the lieu of uh, effective migra uh, immigration reform policy. Um, how much time do I have left, by the way? Two minutes. Negative two minutes? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so program innovations. So you've already seen the outlines of some program in innovations in the CHNV, the Cuban-Haitian, Nicaraguan, Venezuelan uh, program. Um, you are seeing a lot, the PRM, um, uh, the 
the uh, that USCIS are doing uh, to make the process of refugee resettlement more efficient. Um, it is the case that the overseas processing has become much more efficient. The constraints are probably more on the domestic side now and, and really come down to housing uh, availability. Um, you're seeing, uh, again, PRM participating in a refugee diplomacy network, uh, engaging the resettlement area agencies very closely in trying to make uh, the program uh, more efficient. But I think the, the most probably consequential innovation that we've seen comes uh, through the, um, the Biden administration's Western Hemisphere migration management policy. It's perhaps the most far reaching because it does combine within a single policy framework, both humanitarian protection and other non-protection migration pathways. Not the first time that's happened, but I think it's a fundamental uh, shift and uh, probably a, a sign of things to come in, in overall, should there be a second Biden administration, the direction that they would go on these, on these issues. Um, this policy, uh, I, I believe, amounts to a historical significant recognition of the presence of refugees, uh, those in need of humanitarian protection in the Western Hemisphere in Latin America. The FY 2024 presidential determination included an unprecedented regional allocation of between, it was a range and not a figure, between 35,000 to 50,000 resettlement spots for refugees from Latin America and the Caribbean. And compare this to FY22 when the allocation was 15,000 and the actual admissions were 6,312. So how do you get that volume? You don't get that volume uh, in quick order through traditional resettlement. You're gonna get it through the uh, a combination of traditional and the new private sponsorship program, Welcome Poor, uh, which has been stood up, which takes an idea that probably would have been introduced a year or two earlier had it not been for the Afghan and Ukrainian um, arrivals, um, but was in a sense road tested, particularly through Uniting for Ukraine by setting up a sponsorship based uh, system, which has all manner of, you know, questions attached to it in terms of equity of access to protection. But it does spread out, um, frankly, the financial burden as much as anything else, um, if not leaving some question marks about uh, accountability uh, within the system. Uh, for those uh, uh, refugee arrivals. Just to put a point, a fine point on it, the Welcome Corps program, unlike Uniting for, uh, unlike the uh, CHNV programs in particular, and is explicitly part of the Uf U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Welcome Corps is the private sponsorship program. Those that come in under Welcome Corps will count toward the PD, the, the ceiling for admissions. The, um, this regional policy uh, as announced on April 27th, is fundamentally a set of carrots and sticks. And I'm going to credit my colleague, Denise Bell, probably not the first or only person to have said it, but uh, that's where I heard it from her. You know, at least the U.S. policy has carrots. If you compare it to the EU, it's all sticks. Um, so we've already heard a little bit about the circumvention of legal pathways rule. I won't dwell on that. Um, through the Safe Mobility Initiative, part of this Western Hemisphere Management uh, Policy, uh, safe mobility offices, or SMOs, have been opened up uh, since June this year in Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Guatemala. Um, because these are all um, opened through bilateral arrangements with uh, the host, the national governments, they vary considerably in terms of eligibility. I won't go into which nat nationals are eligible through which offices in the interest of time. Um, but the way they're set up is that there is as a, both IOM and UNHCR are involved in the offices, and UNHCR first sees whether there's a protection need for an individual who comes to those offices. Um, and if, if yes, then uh, they try to bring someone to the United States through a protection pathway. If no, then the applicant goes over to the IOM side of the house for a um, uh, immigrant or non-immigrant visa uh, uh, possibility. So uh, including seasonal or temporary employment pathways, uh, not only the U.S., but also to a more limited extent, Canada and Spain are both both involved as potential destinations for the safe mobility offices, at least for some of them. Um, and there's a there's a similar program being set up with Mexico. Um, TPS was the last thing I wanted to sort of mention. I, I should say, though, that this, you know, from 
when I started talking about innovations, I think the safe mobility offices are in many respects the way of the future of that and CPB1. Um, so, you know, looking at this as a sort of embedding humanitarian protection in a broader migration management framework, um, increasing reliance on electronic platforms, um, increasing uh, visibility of IOM in the space. Um, and uh, I can imagine this being seen as a model uh, for some other world regions. Uh, finally, TPS, I was supposed to say a little bit about TPS. We've already heard today, 16 countries currently protected by TPS, uh, providing that uh, to um, over 600,000 foreign nationals, plus an additional 472,000 uh, Venezuelans that could be eligible. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Yes, already good. Okay, well, um, thank you to CMS for inviting me to be part of this conference again, and Don in particular for this panel. As he said, I've been doing it a long time, and on the some years it's good, some years it's bad. This year I'd say the news is mixed. So I'm going to try to take you through um, some of my observations there. And I'll say I know this is a policy conference and I'm a practitioner, but I think what's going on in the ground on the ground in practice and what we see sort of informs the need for policy development. So I hope this will be interesting to the people who are um, thinking and talking about policy. So what is the state of the U.S. asylum system? First of all, I'll just start by reminding people that the U.S. asylum system is really two systems. There's the affirmative asylum system for people who apply on their own for asylum to one of the regional offices of USCIS and get their adjudication through that agency, which is um, housed, located within um, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, and then the defensive asylum process, which we've probably been talking um, more about today, where claims for um, asylum made by people who have been placed in removal proceedings are adjudicated. And those claims are decided by um, so-called immigration judges who um, are housed within the Executive Office for Immigration Review based within um, the Department of Justice. So the law that applies in those two systems, the law governing asylum claims is exactly the same, but the processes are very different. And particularly speaking about the immigration court, I just want to observe for a moment that immigration judges are not regular federal Article Three judges. They're not even Article I judges. They're not in reality judges at all, as one would think of them in the traditional sense. They're administrative officers within EOIR and DOJ, but they don't have all the traditional powers of judges, and they're um, controlled in their employment and in the setting of the law that governs them by the Attorney General of the United States. So they lack the independence of true courts. And I'm, I'm not going to spend time talking about it except to note that there is um, more and more momentum, and there's actually a bill pending in Congress now for movement of the um, immigration courts out of DOJ and into um, Article I courts. And very recently related to what um, Estella was talking about, there's also now a new movement towards creating a separate um, kids court within the existing immigration court system that would be charged specifically with the adjudication of children's claims rather than um, passing them through the existing system, you know, two-year-olds the same as adults representing themselves in court. So just to park the idea of the issues with the courts out there. So the big story, and you heard this um, touched on by Ava earlier, the big story right now in both systems is backlogs. We're um, in a point where ad asylum adjudications in either system are frequently, too frequently, taking five or six years or even more. In immigration courts, it's worse because a lot of cases were delayed by COVID, and every time a hearing has to be rescheduled, it goes to the end of the line. So some of those cases are stretching out, you know, from start to finish 
10 years or so. And I think everyone is familiar with the expression that justice delayed is justice denied. But in this context, it really, to me, represents a failure of state protection when people can't get an adjudication of their most basic asylum claim when they want one, and that in turn delays the onward integration process by delaying people in applying eventually for permanent resident and later for citizenship. So backlogs are the biggest problem, and it exists in um, both processes, the affirmative process and the immigration court process. Estimates vary, the numbers um, range, and it's a moving target because new cases go into each system every day, and there's some fluidity back and forth between the two processes for some reasons that I'll talk about. But the most recent estimate that I saw is that there are 1 million affirmative cases now pending and over 983,000 in immigration court. So we're coming on 2 million pending cases, and I'll note that cases are not persons. A lot of the cases involve families with multiple persons. So the number of people awaiting for an adjudication of their right to protection and their status um, is considerably larger than that. So what factors are contributing to these backlogs? Um, one of them, and John touched on it, is the prioritization of Afghan cases. Normally, there's no differentiation in case processing based on the country from which the applicant comes. But here, Congress has intervened, um, coming out of the fall of Kabul and the creation of Operation Allies Welcome, Congress said that um, Afghans who apply for asylum, and this is often following parole into the United States, but they have to have interviews within 45 days and they have to have adjudications within 150 days. That went well for a little while, but as the numbers mounted up, they were unable to keep up with that. So then there had to be litigation to try to force um, uh, compliance with those time deadlines. There has now been a settlement to that lit litigation where USCIS has agreed, um, sliding scale is not the right um, expression, but they agreed to adjudicate this many within this many days of the settlement, this many within this many days. So there's a sort of revised timeline. But the point for purposes of this talk is that Afghans are going first in the adjudication of their claims. And everyone who's been waiting a long time, no matter how long, um, Afghan cases are taking priority in adjudications, and that's just the way it is. So... Um, that's a big factor in the backlogs. Another one, and I'm not going to talk in detail about the programs, but the parole programs, the United, um, United for Ukraine and the Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, and Venezuelan parole programs, parole itself doesn't put the strain on the asylum office, but the fact that that protection is temporary and many of those parolees then need to apply for asylum within a fixed period of time um, those don't have the per-country um, uh, processing deadlines, but they are new cases that are coming into the system. The third one that's obvious to everyone is border issues that many, many of the asylum officers from all around the country are detailed to the border. Um, since the lifting of Title 42, uh, credible fear interviews and reasonable fear interviews are happening at the border again. So every officer that's detailed to the border to do those or doing reasonable fear interviews by video or whatever they're doing, they're not adjudicating cases in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. So the sort of run-of-the-mill, if you want to call it that, not special program asylum cases are really, really waiting a long time. Um, children, UAC cases, especially represented cases, are able to make a move to get their cases moved into the... Um, so-called non-adversarial asylum system. So some kids' cases that start out in immigration court are ending up in the asylum office. And then a big one is that DHS, in an, um, and ICE in particular, in an effort to reduce the caseload in the immigration courts, launched a large prosecutorial discretion program so individual asylum seekers who are not priorities for removal in the United States can get their cases terminated in immigration court 
but then refile them before the asylum office. So great, good news, you got out of removal proceedings, but bad news is if you wanna have a hope of ever getting your claim adjudicated and maintain your work authorization, you're now filing before the asylum office. So um, you can see how the caseload shifts and where those backlogs come in. Um, in the defensive process, the border cases, as I said, are a big thing. There's also been a problem, which I won't talk a lot about, but since COVID with um, uh, not in-person appearances, WebEx hearings, and what I want to applaud, the big hiring of lots of new immigration judges, that's caused a lot of docket reshuffling, case reassignments, hearings moved from one date to another, one judge to another, and there have been problems with notices, notices arriving after the case was scheduled, after people have in absentia orders because they didn't know in time that they were going to have a hearing or that their hearing was moved to a different court. So there are motions to reopen or motions to reconsider coming into the immigration courts, taking up time for adjudication um, because of that, doc docketing problems and notice problems or failure to get timely rulings on whether the judge or the applicant, I mean, the lawyer or the applicant could appear in person. So those are procedural problems. So I'm going to spend a minute or two on good substantive developments. I think everyone um, knows or has heard me say in past years, very bad developments that came about in the law of partic particular social group, which is one of the big means through which people get asylum particularly gang-based cases coming out of Central America and domestic violence, intimate partner violence, or other intra-family violence was really, really severely curtailed um, by the attorney general under the prior administration. And I should say attorney generals because it was two attorney generals and one acting that took those steps that really um, severely, severely limited and tried to curtail altogether um, availability of asylum for those groups. The good news is that in the current administration, the current attorney general reversed that bad case law, reopened the door to proving those types of claims on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's now the at least opportunity to establish the right to protection by bringing back the old particular social group case law for the domestic violence cases returning to adjudication under a case called ARCG the bad matter of AB is out the window. So that's great. But looking to the future, I think what's been set up is a, you know, lawmaking by election that it's dueling attorney generals. This one makes the law one way. The next guy vacates that law and sends it back the other way so that there's not predictability for applicants or for lawyers. People don't know how to frame their cases. You know, Congress isn't making this law. It's really... Um, become, Wim is saying it too lightly, but the, um, the um, inclinations of the party in power and the attorney general in power is actually driving now what asylum law is um, in the most cutting edge um, groups. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, one thing I'll say that's a bright spot on the horizon, not resolved, but there's increasing receptivity in courts and in a number of circuits in particular to um, women's cases, to only gender plus nationality as a particular social group. So there's been a lot of very hard work to define particular social groups in a way that are going to avoid, you know, show particularity, avoid circularity, a lot of dancing and dancing around showing how women from certain countries need protection. And more and more, nationality plus gender are being recognized as bases for protection. There's a debate whether that, you know, that's the right formulation under asylum law, but just to note, the path starts to be getting a little more clear for women. So I'll end on what that I hope is a positive note. I love being the last person on a long panel right after lunch. Oh, boy. All right. Don asked me to talk on four topics um, that have happened that Biden has taken, four steps Biden has taken to either roll back 
uh, Trump efforts or respond to what's going on at the border. Uh, the first one is also good news, and that deals with family-based immigration. And this is the topic that doesn't really get much discussion. Uh, as you may remember, the Trump administration tried to redefine the public charge ground of inadmissibility uh, and both restrict legal immigration as well as to scare people out of getting certain public benefits that they needed and wanted and deserved. Uh, fortunately, the district courts all across the country stepped in and enjoined that action uh, before it really got implemented. But when Biden came in, all of these were percolating upward. In fact, one of them was actually pending at the Supreme Court. Uh, and what he did was really sort of a master stroke. Uh, it was a very coordinated effort. On one day, the Department of Justice withdrew from all of these pending federal court actions, including the Supreme Court. Uh, and it caught the defendants completely off guard. Uh, they were like, whoa, what happened? Uh, but there was nothing they could do. They tried, but they didn't succeed. Uh, so the public charge ground of inadmissibility, was, Trump's version at least, was wiped off the books. Uh, about a year ago, DHS published their final rule. Uh, it's now been implemented. It's definitely something we can live with. We don't have a lot of anecdotal information yet as to how it's being interpreted, uh, but we're pretty optimistic. The best news, though, is that uh, by having a final rule that's gone through notice and comment period and every, I think it's much less uh, open to disruption by the next administration, whatever that is. Uh, it's kind of immune from, I guess, uh, further tampering. The other thing dealing with family-based is something called family reunification. And if you are living in Cuba or Haiti and you have a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident family member who's petitioned for you, uh, you don't have to wait for that long period of time that it takes for your visa to become current. Uh, there is a program that allows you to reunify and come to the United States while waiting for that priority date to become current. Um, the Trump administration, as you might expect, has suspended that. Uh, the Biden administration has now brought it back and added five new countries. Uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, and just recently Ecuador. Uh, but it's a program that's kind of shrouded in secrecy, so to speak. It uh, is an invite only. We don't have a lot of numbers or anecdotal information as to how many people are actually participating in this, uh, but at least it's there on the books. Uh, the second issue Don asked me to talk about is TPS. We've heard from Eva in terms of the numbers. Let me give you a little bit more details on that. Uh, in 2021, Biden designated for TPS, five new countries. They were Afghanistan, Cameroon, Myanmar, Ukraine, and Venezuela. Uh, then in June of 2023, he rescinded the Trump administration's termination of TPS for El Salvador, Honduras, Nepal, and Nicaragua. Uh, and in fact, uh, a couple months ago, uh, the, the Biden administration extended the registration period from what was 60 days now for the full 18 months. Uh, for those countries. Uh, and then finally, from August through October of this year, he's extended and redesignated TPS for South Sudan, Ukraine, Sudan, Venezuela, Afghanistan, and Cameroon. Uh, but there's more to be done. Advocates are also pushing for TPS designation for 12 additional countries, uh, either from Africa or some in Latin America. Mali, Ecuador, Colombia, Guatemala, Mauritania, Senegal, Haiti, Pakistan, Nigeria, Lebanon, Palestine, uh, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, as you may have read, there's ongoing civil strife and armed conflict in the DRC, which the UN has called what one of the largest internal displacement and humanitarian crises in the world right now. Uh, so a lot going on that we don't read about a lot. Uh, DACA, all right. So go back to the Obama administration. Uh, he's getting very uh, frustrated with Congress's inability to pass action for the Dreamers. These are people obviously who've been in the United States as children who came or brought in mostly by their parents, been here for a while, they don't really know what's going on in their home country, don't have any relationship to it. Uh, anyway, 
it's stalled in various committees, can't get out of uh, Congress. Uh, I think this is really the first time we diagnose this ongoing constipation in Congress on anything of a immigration matter. Um, so advocates are screaming at Obama, do something, do something, and he's going, but I can't, uh, Congress controls this, I don't really have any power. And they're screaming back, yes you can, yes you can. Uh, Don was there and that uh, he remembers it very well. Uh, he says, all right, finally, I'll, I'll grant you this uh, something called DACA. And he did it through executive order, through a notice. Uh, I was driving to work, and suddenly I hear on the radio at NPR, my gosh, there's a whole new program for kids, uh, which was great. And about 900,000 people got DACA status, which allows them to stay here uh, with deferred action for a two-year period, renewable, and get work authorization. Uh, Trump comes in. He terminates it. Uh, that, of course, is challenged as well, and that works its way up to the Supreme Court, which, lo and behold, surprise, says uh, you can terminate DACA, but you can't do it the way you did it. You have to actually come up with some justifiable legal explanation. Uh, so that's great. DACA is still there. Uh, but then, meanwhile, the red states, I call them, are working to overturn DACA by finding a favorable venue in Texas. Uh, and Judge Hannon agrees that, in fact, DACA is illegal. It didn't go through the proper procedure, uh, didn't go through notice and comment, violates what's called the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, and he stops it, enjoins it, but he sort of freezes it. He basically says people can still apply for it. They just can't be adjudicated. There's not going to be any new DACA recipients. Uh, but we'll continue to allow people to renew it and get work authorization and uh, get what's called a, uh, advanced parole. Uh, anyway, the Biden administration says, okay, fine. We will issue a notice and comment. We will issue a proposed rule. We will publish it, and we will finalize it. Uh, and that was done. But did that did not impress Judge Hannon. Uh, he also says, okay, uh, I don't agree with you. Uh, still, you don't have the power to enact something like this. Only Congress does. Uh, and that is now, what, working its way up through the courts, the federal courts, uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, and we anticipate, really, the message from the Supreme Court in a similar case was, yes, you have the executive power to decide not to enforce various laws if you want. You can come up with priorities for enforcement. Uh, but you can't create a whole uh, program that provides benefits, has criteria, invites people to apply, gives them work authorization, other benefits. So uh, I'm not optimistic if this finds its way to the um, Supreme Court as to what's going to happen. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is something uh, that John mentioned, which is this legal pathways. Uh, as you know, Afghanistan blows up. Uh, there is parole, humanitarian parole, for Afghans uh, who are allowed to enter and stay here for two years uh, with work authorization, other benefits as well. Uh, then what happens? Ukraine blows up, uh, and that introduces this whole concept of having a sponsor who fills out a form. It's called an I-134A form. Uh, many people raise their hand and say, yes, we'll take them. They come in uh, as well with humanitarian parole for two years. Uh, and work authorization. Uh, and I think, I'm summarizing, but I think the administration says, well, this was very successful. Let's see if we can't do this in a way that uh, creates a legal pathway for the four countries that are coming to the border in massive numbers, uh, the Cubans, the Haitians, the Nicaraguans, the Venezuelans. So the CHNV Legal Pathways Program was begun. Um, and it was very successful. Two million people raised their hand and said, I will support one of these people. Uh, we've now got a backlog of 1,700,000. 30,000 are allowed to enter the country every year um, with this parole status, which, again, is only valid for two years. Um, how is it being administered? It's a first in, first out, but in order not to discourage all the people who would otherwise look at the backlog and say, forget it, they have half of them are a lottery system where if you apply now, you still have a chance of being selected. Um, 
there is a backlog in granting work authorization, unfortunately. So it takes about two or three months to be granted a work permit, uh, which eats into, of course, your two-year period. And as John indicated, there's no real legal pathway here for any kind of permanent status. Uh, if Congress can't pass anything for Afghanis, I think what they're going to do for Cubans and Haitians and Colombians and whatever. So uh, that's one of the, I guess, Achilles heel in this. It's obviously very vulnerable, subject to the next administration coming in and terminating it if it wants to. Uh, how am I doing on time? Am I doubt or? Another couple minutes. All right. Uh, some things that I think are problematic and which are really obstacles for administration. A, this program is unfunded. Uh, there's no filing fee for filing the work author, the uh, uh, I-134 uh, sponsorship. Uh, and it's going to be subject to legal challenge, right? We've already seen that happen in Texas. So we're going to waiting for the outcome of Judge Hannon on yet another case. Uh, and we can guess how that's going to come out. Big numbers. Uh, Two million people were apprehended in this last fiscal year between ports of entry. Uh, if you add up the people who actually came to the border as well, it's you're now up to three million. Uh, different demographic. We're not talking about Mexicans uh, or people from the three northern uh, Central American countries. We're talking about people from Cuban, Haitian, Nicaragua, Venezuela, but also from China, from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Africa. They now represent more than 50% of the apprehensions, uh, whereas three years ago they represented 12%. Now they're up 51%. Big demographic change and also obviously a big uh, needs that they have. They don't have the history. They don't have the families. They don't have the communities to come here and be absorbed. Uh, so a lot of them are doing what? They're coming to northern cities uh, and falling on the good graces of the city uh, to provide a lot of the housing and social services that they otherwise need. Uh, what else? A lot of push factors, obviously, failing states in Central America, still effects of COVID where countries are really not, haven't bounced back. And you've got these pull factors. <clears throat> you've got... Uh, <clears throat> free buses to northern cities, you've got free housing, you've got an asylum system that uh, I don't know if you'd say it's broken, but it's certainly causing people to come here and wait uh, years before they get their hearing, uh, many of whom can't be sent back anyway, even if they are denied. Uh, you've got inadequate funding. The Biden administration needs a lot more funding for more immigration judges, more staff, um, more asylum officers, uh, more U.S. CIS officers to adjudicate uh, work authorization. Uh, and then finally, migrants are very adapted. They're very well connected. We saw the legal pathways cause a dip in uh, numbers of people coming to the border, only to bounce back fairly quickly uh, once families, for example, which now represent about half the people coming to the border, uh, realize that uh, if they come in, they can't be detained for more than about 72 hours. So you've got uh, a lot of network social media that's telling people exactly where to go, what to do, and how to do it. All right, I'll stop there. So that is a complicated uh, portrait of uh, U.S. immigration law. I can't remember it being so complicated. This is the most complicated year we've ever had. We should have we should have covered fewer issues, I think. <laughs> But uh, maybe uh, let me just maybe provide a little bit of a service. I mean, it seems to me kind of over the course of the day, maybe 30 seconds worth or a minute here, everybody, everybody's agreeing that the current refugee protection system is, is inadequate right now to meet the challenges of forced displacement globally. That's thing number one. Alex wants a shift away from just privileging refugees and the need to have crossed borders to more of a focus on focus on forced displacement and to accountability. Um, those who create the conditions that give rise to refugees or climate uh, refugees or whatever should pay and they should remedy things. I don't know how real accountability actually works in a refugee regime that's actually called something else. I mean, that's, that was an open question that, to me anyway. Um, Although I applaud Alex for the lovely kind of syntheses he's able to do and his kind of visionary take on these things. I think he's terrific. Lots of people are coming. More people want to come, particularly children from, from Central America. I mean, that was quite, quite um, sobering. 
huge numbers of people are in the United States with protection needs. Maybe some don't, but they have protection claims. Some have temporary protected status. Some have humanitarian parole. Some lots and lots have asylum claims, maybe 2 million in total that are kind of before the asylum system and in the immigration courts right, right now. Those folks are going to be here for a long, long, long time, you know, no matter, no matter what the adjudication of their case ultimately is. And you need a refugee resettlement type of program for those folks. You really do. You need something formal and coordinated. But we have congressional gridlock, so I, I think that's probably um, unlikely. Our systems and institutions are overwhelmed, is evidenced best by the backlogs. You have this politically driven busing program, which is really kind of an extraordinary um, effort to create a crisis in pro-immigrant communities and to expose the hypocrisy of pro-immigrant communities. It's been unsuccessful in that. Um, and because of its intentional lack of coordination and planning, you have created problems and you have created kind of a backlash. You have um, a family-based immigration system that's um, that's, you know, kind of reversed the worst successes of the Trump administration and public charge and whatnot. Uh, TPS, DACA has not been expanded. Uh, it, I was talking to a student the other day and didn't, didn't, it didn't dawn on me that we're now seeing in colleges the last class of DACA recipients, you know, that program hasn't, hasn't grown and hasn't expanded. That's, that's an amazing development. And on top of all this, you have kind of an election looming, a very uncertain election looming. So it's a very, very complicated time right now. Anybody have um, que <laughs> I was going to say questions. You all have questions. How about any comments? Any let me hand it over to you. My, my job is done at this point. Hello. Yeah. So my name is Sergio Monterroso. I'm a social researcher. And a lot of you guys, thank you, first of all, for coming and educating us on your work and your knowledge. But uh, my question is, you, got, you guys all spoke about how the U.S. response is focused on safe mobility, naturalization, integration into our society, but at what point does it become our financial responsibility to invest directly in these countries so they have better educational opportunities and economic opportunities, and we can create an impact on the data that Estella showed us, that a majority of young people want to come here because they don't see a future over there? I, I would suggest that just one of us answer each question because we can't, yeah, because we don't have that much time. Uh, well, I don't think I have an answer, but I, that, uh, other than saying that that's really Stop urgent. Right oh, of course. Um, am I doing it right? Yeah. Um, I don't know what I can answer to that other than our data really shows it is it is urgent. I mean, it is, there's a need. Uh, so I, if anything, I'd open the floor. Yeah, maybe since we speak of, we're, yeah, we're a team, so I get to answer too. But <laughs> yeah. <it> just... <laughs> Really brief, briefly in the Central America case, I think we are making, we, the U.S. government is making a lot of investments and part of where, you know, our data comes from evaluations of programs to see what kind of difference is actually being made. I think the challenge is the things are shifting from, you know, security-based programs and, and trying to really combat security to poverty prevention to now education. And it's, it's all it's all of the above, and I think that's what we're trying to impress upon the Agency for International Development, State Department, and others who run these programs is you need a whole basket of programs. You can't have these standalone programs that are going to, yes, maybe somebody feels a little bit more secure, but since then, you know, their brother lost their job that was supporting the entire family, and so now somebody needs to migrate, or they still don't feel like they, or they have better resources and better ways to connect and they actually have more skills through say a workforce development job or workforce development program but they see that workforce development program as a step towards getting a job in the United States because 77 percent of them don't see a future in their country so I think there's a lot being done but it just needs to be done better I think the Biden administration's goal was something around four billion dollars worth of investment in in uh migration related activities in the region. I don't know how they're doing in terms of, oh, well, I do know they're not anywhere near that 4 billion mark. Um, but it's part of our work is to try to make that, um, 
provide the feedback loops of how is that working, is it working, and what else needs to be done. So, um, Don, I know you said one answer, but can I can make one comment? Sure. Okay. Yeah, Charles, uh, Don, excuse me. Yeah, thanks. Charles, you may have said this, but I, I'm not sure I heard it. Uh, currently, the number of uh, people being allowed into the country, how many of them have a actual destination address versus those historically who, who have come in? So this is not my necessarily area of expertise. Um, the CHNV program allows 30,000 per month. Uh, so if you do the math, that's 360,000 360, per year uh, of a largely, and you compare that with 1 million more or less permanent residents who get their green card through either family-based or employment-based or through refugee adjustment. Uh, so it's a sizable number. Uh, as to the makeup of the population, uh, as I indicated, these four countries don't have the same kind of history that Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador has in the United States. Uh, so they don't have the families, the connections, whatever. So they're taking these free buses to northern cities, uh, and they're much more dependent on the local services that are there. Um, as to numbers and percentages, I don't know. I don't know if any of you all have the information. Uh, I just know that it's putting a big strain where otherwise, if you had the normal uh, migration, you wouldn't be seeing this. Great. Thank you so much for, for this panel. This has been really enlightening. Um, Jody Ziesberg from the New York Legal Assistance Group. I have sort of one comment and then a question. Um, it seems to me that you're know, talking about the problem of backlogs and this enormous number of people and applications for asylum that are, that are pending right now. It seems like a half measure to what Dean Alikoff was saying at the beginning of having to go through these individualized adjudications of all of these asylum applications is really contributing to a lot of the bureaucratic backlogs and then the instability. And as you, Karen, as you mentioned, that all of the then delaying the integration of people. So it seems I wonder if there's any efforts to not have to individually adjudicate all of these cases and to not have to you know, the administration could stipulate to asylum in many of these cases. And I think particularly about Afghan, where it doesn't seem to be in question that they fit the current, albeit narrow, definition of asylum. To have to then go through and individually adjudicate all of these cases seems to be a waste of everyone's resources and also is contributing to a lot of this um, problems that we've discussed. Um, and then one question I have... For, for John, I think there's, I'm curious about why some of these private sponsorships have been extended to some countries, for example, Venezuela, which there doesn't seem to be a lot of sponsors in the United States, and not to Afghanistan, where there seems to be a, a lot of, um, you know, connection and people who would be willing to sponsor and yet no program opening up for those individuals. Um. I can say, I, I think there will always be at least a partial need for a case-by-case -case adjudication because of the background checks, criminal checks, and so forth. So I don't think we're ever going to get a blanket XYZ group automatically can get asylum. But what you're recommending about recognizing certain groups as, you know, having um, potentially very strong or viable claims seems to be starting to happen. I saw one report, and I'm not going to name it. Some people in the room may have seen it, but I saw a report in the last week or so that a memo went out in one of the regional asylum offices naming a certain group from a certain country that was supposed to be, per se, particular social group. So absent anything else, those claims should be good. So if that happens and if that represents national guidance, that would clear a huge backlog. And I think that's a great approach for certain groups. And it doesn't matter to me if it's not a perfect solution. If it clears some of them, that's progress. Somebody else said it earlier. Any you know, little bit, you know, is good if it gets rid of some of the backlog. So I hope they'll think more about those things. But especially I hope the thing I heard is true. 
question. Maybe I'll address the second one. I mean, the, the sequencing was such that the Afghan program came first, and it came at a time when plans were already being worked up for a private sponsorship program. Um, and in the case of the Afghan evacuation, I mean, they had to get people out yesterday. And that's a, yeah, and that is uh, a really um, sort of a lot of folks in horrific circumstances, all the more so that uh, Pakistan has seen fit to expel Afghans in the past couple of weeks. Um, uh, I should say, just to be very clear, the new private sponsorship program, the Welcome Corps, is not inherently limited in terms of nationalities. Um, again, this is to admit people through the refugee program, but to uh, to private sponsors um, rather than through the government-funded uh, reception and placement um, services. The initial emphasis, in fact, uh, well, there's two phases to that program. The first is um, this, uh, y you basically say, I'm willing to sponsor someone, but you don't get to say who it is. And the second phase is meant to be this sort of naming where it's a specific individual or family that you're, you're bringing in. And that's, there's been a lot of outreach to communities that, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus and others who've been, uh, seen as, you know, um, the UNHCR referral system has been less sensitive to their vulnerabilities. And, and if there are sponsors in the U S um, that could be helpful. Geographically, the program was to have begun in South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So again, to kind of address um, the injustice of the kind of backlog uh, in that system in, in Africa, but it's also going to be expanded out. And I think it's already being talked about or expanded out to, to other geographies as well. So um, it's, it's, it's not as tightly targeted as the Cuban, Haitian, uh, Nicaraguan, and Venezuelan program. I think we had a question over here. Maybe since you'd gone earlier, can I pass it to your colleague here? Um, hi, my name is Dan Burkowski. I'm from the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights uh, here in New York. And so when I hear this word integration, you know, speaking about integrating, um, you know, refugee or immigrant communities into other communities, I kind of think of this as a two way street, whereas it's not simply, you know, providing these communities, these populations with, um, resources to participate and flourish in the new society, but also is there a way that, you know, is there any framework that exists to um, basically prepare the host population as well to receive these people, not only economically or politically, but also socially and culturally? <laughs> I, I'm going to, I'm going to defer uh, to others in the room who might have a, a better answer, but I'll begin by uh, mentioning there's a, an organization, Welcoming America, um, that's a member of the RCUSA coalition that really has a set of criteria for kind of certification as welcoming cities, which involves a kind of a, a whole of society, whole of local society approach, as I understand it. And so um, I think the, yeah, you're absolutely right. Integration is, is a mutual process of the uh, the newcomers and the and the welcomers and 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 I I do feel that uh, you know there's there's some some good models for programming to to make that uh, you know more of a to make that more of the case in in reality one more question Uh, briefly, I wonder if you, any of you see any pathway, any glimmer of hope for congressional action on immigration reform? I can answer that. No. <laughs> Agree. I mean, it's really not in the interest of the Republican Party at this point to do anything that would in favor of any kind of cleanup or reform. Uh, they'd much rather use this as a weapon and a stick and beat the administration uh, over the head with it and point to the border and say this is all Biden's fault and therefore reelect Trump or whatever. So, no. I'm going to make the easiest prediction in the world. You will see many, many more buses arrive in Chicago at the time of the Democratic <laughs> National Convention. I 
I think I'm getting a signal. It's time to stop. Um, we good? All right. So thank you very much, panelists. Appreciate it. And we'll see you in 10 minutes.